So, uh, uh, so the topic includes a general, uh, uh, I try to address a general uh, uh, statement about causal perception using a specific uh, example and uh, support from a specific system, which is the Rosen system uh, during object localization. So, I'll start with the with the general uh, uh, statement that I. Uh, try to make here. Definitely, uh, since it's a general statement, it's more speculative than the data that I'll present later. I start with this in order to give you enough time to build up your objections to the scheme that I propose and, uh, and confront them with the data that I'll present later. So what I try to do here is to present the problem, so-called problem of perception, and condense something like uh, many years of debate to two basic lines that uh, to me summarize the, the gist of the, uh, the so-called problem of perception. And the, the problem is the following. Our everyday experience suggests to us that perception is direct. It's not mediated by anything, and it's not delayed. So if you perceive a scene, uh, and we perceive uh, that uh, this person is going to hit the ball, we perceive it in real time in a way that we'll be able to catch, to catch the ball. In contrast, physics tells us the perception is mediated by physical elements which exhibit delays. And uh, this is basically, if you take the, uh, most of the debates about perception, they sum up to this, to this debate which says, we have an intuition, but the intuition is contradicted by what we know about physics. And usually what we do in these conditions is we tend to dismiss our intuition in favor of the physical evidence and uh, just dismiss it as another illusion might be just another one. What I would like to propose here, and this is a proposal, that we don't have to do it in this case. We don't have to dismiss our intuition uh, because, in fact, physics contains a kind of loophole through which direct perception can enter. So basically, this intuition actually can live together with, this, uh, uh, with, with uh, physics. And the loophole is any guesses? What is the loophole that physics allows? So physics uh, uh, provides that allows direct perception with physical elements. Uh, and this is, you could guess, this is the closed loop in uh, steady state. So closed loops, if we assume that the perceiver, whatever the perceiver, and the object are part of the same closed loop, and the closed loop is in steady state, that is, the behavior is stable, then P and O, the perceiver of the object, or any two elements in the loop, have no legs between them. There's no way you can say that the perceiver uh, precedes or legging the object, or vice versa, because in a closed loop in steady state, there's no way to say uh, who is legging, who is preceding. They actually exist at the same time. If, uh, if we assume that uh, perception emerges from the entire loop, then even if we give up even the mediation part. If in this case, we can talk about mediators in the process, which are also part of the loop. In this case, we also can give up the mediation. And then we say, if perception occurs in closed loop, in steady state, then our intuition can live with uh, physics. This is the claim? Steady state means that it's essentially static, so there's no time. No, there is time. Steady state means that the uh, uh, behavior is stable, meaning that it's predicted. No, no, it's a perceiver, and uh, once you divide the loop to parts, you can say, you know, part of the loop I can call it a predictor, the other part I can call it a perceiver, and the claim will be that we should relate to the entire loop as a perceiver. It includes components. If you try to reduce it, you can call part of it predictor and part of it uh, perceiver, or sensor, sensor and predictor, but the overall, the claim is the, the entire uh, scene or object is captured by a loop, and the loop, the entire loop is a perceiver. Yeah, Unless the, the situation is not just steady state but constant in time, mm -hmm. there's always a difference between the P and the O. So we'll, we'll talk about we'll, sort of delay we'll, we'll talk about physical time and perceptual time. We'll talk about physical time and perceptual time. Of course, there's a temporal issue here. The question is, what is the time slot in which uh, these state and st statements uh, can live? And definitely, they cannot live very small time slots, but the claim will be that these are the actual perceptual time slots, so the perceptual <laughs> clock 
is the clock in which the perceiver and the object live together at the same time. But this will come to this point towards the end of the, of the talk. So why do I talk about loops at all? Uh, what perception has to do with loops? Uh, definitely it has a lot to do with loops because we all know that the brain contains a closed loop between the sensory pathways and the motor pathways. Every sensory organ is driven by motor afferents and is sending afferents, uh, afferents to the brain and these uh, uh, connections are closed by multiple closed loops. But here you might say, okay, so the sensory organ is part of the loop, but how an external object can become part of the loop? And the answer is the following. If you take, uh, for example, I take here two sensory organs. One is the whisker, which will be the star of the top, and the other is the eye. If you take the whisker, then it takes an uh, efferent command to, move, to activate the, the muscle that moves the whisker. The whisker touches the object. As a result of the touch, there will be mechanoreceptors in the follicle that are activated, and they wouldn't be activated otherwise. So if the whisker moves in air and there is no object there, these receptors would not be activated. So the fact that they are, are activated and they close the loop means that actually the existence of the object is part of the loop. Because if there was no object here, the loop was not closed. Okay, this is the way that the sensory organ basically includes an external object in the loop. And it's not specific to, to the touch sense. Also with vision, you can uh, uh, realize that the case is similar. If you want to see the object, if the brain wants to see the object, it must, and the object doesn't move, and doesn't flinch, it must move the eye. Once it moves the eye, uh, photoreceptors in the retina will be activated, and if there was no object here, if everything was uh, uniformly gray, these photoreceptors would not be activated, if the, even if the eye is moving. So the fact that they are activated actually includes the object in the loop of the brain. Okay? Yeah. Would you relate that to the fact, the idea that mirror neurons are much better activated uh, if there is an object than if there is no object? <coughs> what do you mean? So mirror neurons can be activated without objects? Uh, in principle, yes, but, but the data suggests that the mirror neurons are activated much stronger if the, if the grasp is not serrated, but really there is a real object there. Yeah, I have to think about. I mean, the, the how to put. I, I, I'm sure the mirror neurons. The fact that you have mirror neurons uh, relates to these loops. Uh, how exactly they relate is, I think, it's, uh, an open question. I, I wouldn't commit at this stage. Okay, so so this was the gen general claim. The general claim was that <coughs> uh, the intuition of direct perception and physics can live together in the framework of closed loops. I showed you the way that uh, the brain can include external objects in its own loops. And now let's go to the specific uh, uh, system of the RET. I'll show you uh, the evidence that we collected, and at the end we'll go back to the main, uh, to the general uh, speculation or, or statement. So this is the RET. When it uh, tries to sense the environment, it moves both the head and the, and the whiskers uh, pretty fast, and you can, you can uh, train it to localize objects uh, and, and it can uh, reach a very accurate uh, uh, acuity, very high acuity. Uh, this is actually a level of, uh, that we call hyperacuity because the uh, offsets between the two poles that the red can detect are much smaller than the offsets between two neighboring whiskers. <coughs> this, uh, two so it reaches a, a resolution which is uh, much better than the granularity of <coughs> its uh, sensors. And he does it. Uh, it can do it using, uh, the rest can do it using a single whisker of each sign, so it doesn't depend on the special extent, but it does depend on the power of whisking. The more whisking it does, the smaller the threshold that it can uh, uh, reach. Now, you may notice that uh, the way the rest uh, move the whiskers is not so coherent and not so ordered. It's not because they cannot do it very synchronized or or uh, coordinated, they can. If you don't, if they are not engaged in a task <coughs> and there's no contact, then they move the whiskers very synchronously and very coordinated. So the fact that they, the whisking is messy has to do something with the task. And the in interesting question, of course, if it's only a noise, uh, 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 just on whisking, or 
there is some order in the in this chaos uh, that is guided by the by the brain of the perceiving rat, and we began to address this question. Or actually, Guy and uh, uh, Pearl started by looking at the trajectories, recording the movement of the whiskers very carefully. We did it so far only in single whisker uh, uh, rats, and marking the the timing of the contact. These are the heavy marks here, and computing two variables. Out of it, one is delta t, which is the difference in time between the contacts in the two two sides, and the other is, regardless of time, the difference in angle between the two sides uh, upon the first contact of either of the two, and analyze the development of these variables along along the trial. <coughs> on average, uh, rats can do one, two, or three, or four cycles. We'll, we'll touch on this point later on. <coughs> if you look at the information. <coughs> Uh, that each of the variables contain about the decision of the rest, or the perceptual report of the rest, if you decided that uh, this is more posterior, this is more, more posterior, as a function of cycle in the first cycle, second cycle, and in the last cycle, where, whenever it occurs, you see that there is some dynamics. The information of delta t goes down, and the information in delta a, the difference between the, uh, the whiskers, goes up along the trial. So there is some some order in the chaos, there is some uh, purpose for this, for this uh, movement. It doesn't change randomly. So what, what is delta t again? Delta t is the difference in the, between the contact times. So we take the moment that this uh, touches and the moment that the right one touches and compute the difference. So this is and delta a is whenever the first one touched, what is the uh, angular difference? Between the two but, but delta t is controlled by the experiment? Or the right? By the experiment. So uh, as experimenter, we put the two poles like this, but the animal can move the head, can change the speed. Delta A is an external variable. No, no, no. Delta A is the, both are controlled by the, by the red. Delta A is the motor command, the motor output of the, of the uh, whisker. So the red can position the whiskers in this way. They can be either co fully coordinated, delta A will be zero, or the right one will lead, and delta A will be positive. This is up to the, to the red. It's not by the contact. It's computed that the first contact, so let's say it first touches the left uh, pole. At this moment, it doesn't touch the right pole, necessarily. Mm -hmm. At this moment, we compute delta A. OK? So it's the difference between the, the whisker that is uh, It's in the dark. It's all in the dark. This is relative to the head. Yeah, relative to the head. Everything relative to the head. What about the head? The head is a different story. We track the head. We track the head also. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a different story. It's uh, more complex. Here, we, in this experiment, we have the way to come <coughs> to uh, reach a nose fork with his nose, so forcing him to do some balancing and movement. So basically, this is to tell you this is average across four rats. And uh, to tell you that there is some order here. It's not a mess, not just a mess, but the rats try to do something with the whiskers. <coughs> We, we do not claim that we understand what every rat is doing because they really, their behavior depends on many, many variables. They don't behave the same. They don't use the same strategies. But on average, you see this, these patterns. OK, so obviously, this is controlled by the brain, uh, uh, this, uh, or by this, uh, this model of sensory loops. And uh, our next task was to try to understand how uh, these loops control um, what, uh, what, uh, what the rat perceives. And we did what engineers usually do when they come to such a complex uh, closed-loop system. They, they open the loop, uh, try to study every component uh, by itself, and then try to make sense of the whole thing together. So we did the same. We opened the loop. We did the whisking for the animal. We anesthetized the animal in this case. We do the whisking for the animal and uh, record from the very first station of the system, and uh, uh, which are the cell bodies who send the receptors to the, to the follicle. So this is the very first station in the system. And to make the long story short, this is uh, published data. I may even talk about it here uh, a few times. I'll just remind you. We tested the system in two conditions, risking in air and, and touching against an object. And we found that what uh, <coughs> you can find in textbooks usually uh, the selectivity is that is described in textbooks about passive touch, uh, adapt, uh, slowly adapting versus rapidly adapting direction, sensitivity, etc. 
is not so much relevant to the active mode. In the active mode, this sense tells the brain a totally different story that it cannot tell it in the passive mode, and the story is built by three main sub-stories. One story about self-motion, the motion of its uh, own whiskers. Second, about touch, and the third that I'll not describe today is a more complex whisking touch uh, story. And just briefly, briefly, the information about touch is sent by single receptors of different colors. These are PSTHs. This is protraction time moving forward. This is retraction time moving backward. And different cells report, so to speak, on different phases along the protraction. Similar to the way you might think uh, hippocampal places in the hippocampus report about different places in the movement of the animal, these are kind of places for the whisker trajectory. And you can describe the fields. These are the firing fields. In the barrel cortex? No, this is the very first input. Ah, just a these, are the, these are the receptors. These are the receptors. Uh, you can describe them as uh, spanning a specific temporal phase or spatial phase. I'm not going into it. Just say that the uh, empirical evidence, not only from our lab, suggests that it's basically a spatial phase. So they report, given a movement from here to here, they report at what fraction of the space they are at a given moment. This is the information the same, but it's not crucial for what I would like to tell you today. The second type of touch neurons, they don't fire at all when the whisker moves in free air, but the moment it touches something, some of the neurons will fire briefly. The moment it <coughs> detaches, other neurons will fire. And as long as it is touching and pressing against an object, a third family of neurons will continuously fire. And what is important to our talk today is how these neurons encode the location of the object. And basically what we found uh, is that the encoding is kind of orthogonal coding. They use spatial coding or label line coding for the vertical dimension, uh, temporal coding for the horizontal dimension, and rate coding for the radial dimension, for the distance from the face out. Uh, you can think about a single axon, basically, conveying all these three coordinates in its firing. By the fact that it fires, it supports the vertical dimension. Uh, by the delay to the beginning of the firing, it reports the horizontal one. And by the spike count, it reports the radial, the radial distance, in principle. So, and this, uh, and, and, and here I'd like to share with you some of my experience <coughs> here that might be useful to some of you. Uh, we, what, in, in, I started to tell you about what we found here, but basic, uh, in, in, uh, in practice, we started our journey into the brain, is to use uh, Moshe Abel's uh, terminology, in the cortex, like many others. <coughs> we told ourselves, why bother ourselves going to these real neurons which simply transfer the, informa the, the sensory information as this to the cortex, where all the interesting stuff uh, is happening. Let's go directly to the cortex. And what happened is that we, we couldn't make sense. We had, you know, many observations. We had many interpretations. But every interpretation depended on the theory that we had in mind or we, that we could put about what this piece of uh, tissue is supposed to do. If we assume assumption one, <coughs> the interpretation will be one. If we assume another thing, <coughs> interpretation will be another one. So we figured that if we go to the input level and figure out what enters this cortex, we might see what it computes. We went to the thalamus. It didn't uh, uh, help much. We went to the brainstem and, 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 and saw some light in the brainstem in terms that we understood, once we were here, we understood that there are actually not one pathway to the cortex, but two pathways to the cortex going through two uh, uh, subnuclei of, of the thalamus. And we, we could characterize the different codings that use there, but we didn't understand what they do in terms of uh, functional computation for, for the rest, and it was only when we get to the receptor level itself that we saw the light, so to speak. And the light, in this case, was this small arrow. So basically, <coughs> what we understood when we got to this level is that events do not start by activation of, of receptors in the follicles. Events actually start by the movement of the, of the sensory organ. And this was a great change in uh, whatever we thought uh, so far, and this, this, this was what led us to, actually, to these to this findings, to understanding that the, the coding depends on the motion, and moreover, to realizing that not only that the coding is a function of, of the motion, it depends very much on the motion. So 
If I told you that the vertical dimension is encoded by label line, this is because the whiskers are moving only in one direction, they're not in the other direction. So if, if this row hits the, the object, then the brain might know that this is the height and not this is the height. But what if the motor control orients, you know, the face this way or the other way? The coding is different. The radial dimension is depending on the amount of spikes emitted by the neuron, and this depends on the force of the interaction between the whisker and the object, but what if the force is larger? Then the quantity, in principle, this is the coding variable, but quantitatively, the code, the value of the code will change according to the motor activation. And if you change the whisker velocity, of course, the temporal code will, will change here. So this was one lesson. Another lesson was observation, which is very important in this respect, was that if you look at the same rate, a few minutes with a few minutes difference doing the same thing, perceiving the same uh, same object, in principle it does the same thing. It goes out and whisks against the object and touches it, but if the details are different. The actual contacts with the objects are always different. You, you will never find uh, a sense of motion which is the same from trial to trial, and this is true not only in the tactile case. This is true with eye movements, it's true with every sense uh, uh, th that is active. So, so obviously the brain needs to know about self-motion when it comes to build, so to speak, build its internal representation and make sense of the external world. In this case of the horizontal location, it needs it must make use of the whisking cells, which actually gives him a reference signal when whisking started, where is all every uh, the whisker at every moment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So let's have a look how internal representations look like in this uh, in this system indeed. And now we reverse the order. So once we saw the light, we use the light as a, as a searchlight when going back through the system. Uh, people have changed, although Sebastian is, is always there from the beginning. And what we learned? What we learned, first thing, is that uh, these three <coughs> different signals that I that we found in the follicle are traveling to the brain in parallel through the brainstem and through these two pathways that we found before, but actually through a, also a, a cell pathway. So they're actually what we found now that we know what we are looking at and combined it with, uh, with, uh, with the anatomy, uh, then we realize that there are, there are no only two pathways, but at least three pathways. And more important than this, we knew what function they actually convey. And this pathway actually convey the self-motion uh, uh, information about whisking, and this pathway convey the touch information, and this one convey the more complex information. Again, we'll not deal with it today. So what we also learn is that these different signals are conveyed in parallel. They do not interact up to the thalamic, thalamic level and only start interacting in the thalamocortical level. This is what we found. What we know from the literature is that this thalamocortical system is well uh, connected uh, with closed loop within the systems, and also every station has its own uh, closure to the to the motor pathway, producing parallel uh, or nested closed loops. And it's also probably known; it's hard to tell, but the science are saying that evolution goes this way, from the inner one to the other one. <coughs> it's not so much relevant to the talk today, but it helps us making sense of the of what we see. So, okay, so I told you about the encoding. Now the question is the recoding. How these internal representations are generated and how they are look like in the brain. We talk about horizontal localization. We took one coordinate of the tree. So we talk about integration of these signals. And since they are not integrated before the thalamocortical level, then <coughs> obviously our target should be the thalamocortical uh, network. Uh, it's not an easy target. The, uh, uh, it contains many substations. It's hard to know how to divide them. In the thalamus, it's easy. We have the three subnuclei. In the cortex, based on anatomy and other signs, we divided the network to five stations. In S1, the superficial layers, layer 4 and layer 5A. Layer 4, four is the main input of the one of the nuclei, and 5A is the main input of another nuclei. And in S2, we took, the, again, according to anatomy, two subdivisions, superficial and deep, and deep layers. And we look at all these eight, uh, 
eight stations, again, you anesthetize animal with the same paradigm that I showed you before. It's anesthetized. We do the whisking for the animal. The whisking looks like this. If you look at the angle of the whisker, this is five whisking, forward movement, backward movement, protraction, retraction, and these are the curvatures that are produced at the base of the, of the whisker when the whisker is touching something or, or does not touch anything. And, and here I showed you a population response. These are recordings were done one at a time or two at a time, not all together simultaneously, but we use exactly the same stimulus paradigm. So we use here the ergodic assumptions that says if had we recorded them simultaneously, maybe they would look like this. And we sum up all the responses in every nucleus, every station by itself. And look at the population response that is generated. You can see the dynamics of the response. Here. And to demonstrate it, I'll say it again from left to right. Focus on one line, let's say the top line or the second line, and tell yourself when you can already predict the next uh, the next uh, response. So probably somewhere like here, many of you would say, "Okay, I know already what's going to come because the response look alike." And naturally, we call this the steady state, this period the steady state, and the uh, first one, the transient state. And if we look at the, so we, we, we run several analysis to look, <coughs> to look uh, about the information, dynamics of uh, information that this uh, uh, network has about the position of the object. We position the object in three, three different locations, and we look at the accumulated information in the entire network. And information, as you see, goes up about this uh, location selectivity, goes up uh, on average across the network. And somewhere around the fourth or fifth uh, cycle, it, it kind of stabilizes. If you, if you look for every cell and ask yourself when a weak cell shows a significant selectivity between positions, then the number of such cells also increases uh, monotonically. Uh, we look at three basic uh, response uh, parameters, firing time, firing rate, and the binary firing rate, firing rate which can be considered as a label line, and they all show, show the same dynamics. I, if you go further and, and, and try to identify specific neural codes, then what we did in this respect was nothing uh, sophisticated. We simply looked at the PSTHS by eyes and said, look, okay, this will look like a basic a coding scheme and, and classify them according to this. Uh, then we came up with four basic codes. One is a temporal code, like in the periphery. Uh, the timing of the response uh, denotes the location of the object. So if you have three locations, more posterior, the most posterior, more anterior, and more anterior, then the time of the response will be delayed for the more anterior one, exactly as in the periphery. We see it also in the telemocortical network. The second code, is the rate code. The position of the of the object is encoded by the rate of the response either in increasing manner or decreasing manner. You mean different neurons? This is, this is there are three different neurons. Okay, just examples of three different neurons. And if you try to imagine the computational guy among you, how to generate sorry? Temporal code and, and, and rate code. Yes. You talk about different neurons now? Yes, yes, all different neurons. Right. These are examples okay. from the network, from these 2,200 neurons, <coughs> pick up examples, and I show the distribution soon. So these are three neurons, three different neurons showing temporal code, three different neurons showing a rate code. And this is production time. And these are the three different locations. And if you try to think how these uh, rate codes are generated, or basically how the temporal information existing in the periphery is deleted, so to speak, from the firing of the neurons, you find out that this is not a trivial uh, issue. And two kinds of labeled line codes. So the classical time which says the neuron will fire only for one location, either for the red location or the green location or the blue location, or a more uh, le less efficient uh, labeled line code, which is a labeled line code which is restricted to only a certain temporal window within the... Within the and, and if you look at the distribution of this code in the, sta in the different stations, just to see if one station used one code and the other station used <coughs> another code, then you find that the answer is no. Uh, you find the different codes in all stations. These are, these are the eight stations, never mind the exact uh, marking here. Uh, 
Uh, you can, this is cumulative distributions of the strength of the code in each uh, station. And you can realize that almost all stations contain all codes, but with different uh, distributions. For example, the label line code is mostly prevalent in, in, in the superficial layer of the one here and in the down. <coughs> while the window label line code is more prevalent in S2, for example. The temporal code is more prevalent in S1 layer 4 and it's down. So these are distributed networks of, of, of coding, including the entire system with different uh, different distributions. If you look for this specific code for the stabilization dynamics, you find the similar stabilization dynamics. On the fifth cycle, they already stabilized uh, 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 these codes. So, so we see a dynamics that uh, that uh, dominates this thalamocortical network, which has some uh, transient period for for four or five cycles and then stabilization. Let's let's see how how long it takes for the red to localize an object, and this is one example. Let's count the number of contacts here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So for this trial, it uses indeed something like four, four trials, four uh, contacts in the left side, and, and this is not accidental. This is this is the distribution of the number of contacts required for this wedge to get to this hyperacuity that I showed you, the black one, is not the gray one, and the mode is between four and five five contacts. So this is indeed the number of contacts that were uh, used. In addition, the same, the same uh, dynamics of four or five cycles was dominated by two kinds of waves. I'll, I'll run on, on it uh, quickly. Uh, just to mention that there is a bottom-up wave going from the thalamus through the deep layer, and the top is uh, the top, which means mo the most delayed responses are in the superficial layers of S1. And there is a top-down wave, a very slow, a slow wave that takes the entire four or five cycles and it goes in the other direction. It starts at the, at the top levels and ends up in the, in the uh, thalamus. And another thing I would like to mention to you is the uh, possible transformations that might, may occur between the different codes that we observe. So I told you that uh, that you need, in order to get to any representation of the horizontal location, you need to combine the position cells that are present in the POM with the touch cells, with the touch information, in a way that tells you that if this cell tells you when the touch occurred, the other cells will tell you where is the specific risk at, this, at the time that the touch occurs. And you have to combine these two information in order to know where is the object. So if you combine them in a naive way, let's say in using a coincidence detector, <coughs> which says, let's say just multiply the two, the two functions, you'll get uh, responses like this. Responses like this, are, uh, uh, they have the temporal aspect because it's preserved from here, but they'll emphasize one of the positions because of this coincidence uh, function. And we find these kind of responses, which are a combination of temporal and rate, and rate codes uh, in the cortex and thalamus, and in the cortex they are mainly in layer five, layer four, and layer mostly in layer four uh, of S1. And then <coughs> remember this label line code that I showed you before. This uh, code we find, as I showed you, we find mostly in the superficial layers in layer uh, two, three. Now, if I think about the way that this uh, this code would be transferred to this code, what would be the mechanism? that you would suggest for this transformation? Any idea? Hi. How would you... Threshold. How you move? Threshold, exactly. Right. So you use threshold. From here to here, you just cut, cut the responses, so to speak. You use... You, you use threshold. You use some inhibition in order to inhibit the weak responses and allow only the high responses. Evidently, you will lose in firing rate, and indeed, the firing rate of these responses is, is much lower than this one. And indeed, the layer 2, 3 is known to be full with inhibition. Inhibition, everybody who records in uh, layer 2, 3 sort of complains about the sparse coding or the very sparse firing of layer 2, 3 neurons because of uh, uh, the much inhibition that is there. But so it, it fits the anatomy uh, that we see. And the same, the same, uh, the same input could serve now a different computation via 
either Facebook loops or GABA-B inhibition uh, to, produce, uh, to produce the rate coding. I'm not going to either of these ones. Uh, this is a model of David Golov. This is a model we suggested <coughs> a while ago. Both could produce this kind of coding. And the only code that we cannot link to any other codes, meanwhile, is this one. We are not sure, not sure how it is related. Okay, this was a bit fast, but uh, those of you who, who, who captured the transformation uh, are invited to think a little bit about it. But anyway, the idea, basic idea is that we have here a network in the thalamocortical uh, <coughs> network of, uh, of neurons distributed in the entire network. Remember that this is highly connected <coughs> network. And presenting all these kinds of codes, some of them are transformable from one to another. You can explain that. But for, for the message of today, the important, the important question is, uh, what are the relationships between these recordings that we did with the anesthetized animal. We couldn't do this systematic study in the behaving animal. It's simply <coughs> not possible. But then we must ask, uh, what are <coughs> the relationships? Is there, do we believe that the same coding schemes and the same dynamics occur in the behaving animal? We don't know, but we have two evidence to support this uh, link. One is this says that I just showed you in layer 4 and layer 5a. Uh, there was a study, those of you who heard David Kleinfeld here not so long ago uh, may remember the recordings that he showed in the behaving animal uh, and showing exactly the same coding in layer 4 and 5a of, of S1. So this is one link, the link between the anesthetized and behaving rats, and the other one is the behavioral one, uh, which shows us that uh, the dynamics is similar. The dynamics, the convergence occur in something like four or five cycles, both in these circuits and in the, in the, in the behaving animal, which suggests to us that there is some hardwired circuit here that w uh, whatever happens, or never mind what, is, what triggers it, it takes these four or five cycles to stabilize. And this hardwired mechanism is used by the brain during the behavioral uh, uh, session to to converge upon the right uh, right perception of the but yes but the the, the the number of the present point is not dependent on the noise level it's the present the, the, the number of cycles you need to get to overcome the present uh, <coughs> is supposed to be but, but hardly uh, hardly dependent on, on the, the noise level. but remember that in this task there is no noise induced by the world the environment is steady but the only noise is uh, induced by the animal itself and we think it's not noise. We think it's actually an algorithm, convergence algorithm. But of course, there's motor noise, etc. So, uh, I think I did something. Do you know if these cells in the cortex that No, we, we know that all of them, it's a, a very highly connected network, the thalamocortical network. Yeah, I mean we know some of the connectivity, distribution of connectivity, for example, POM projects mainly to layer 5A, DPM mainly to layer 4. So we know... Yeah, but the mind, mind the connectivity, I mean, that's the frequency of... So we know, for example, the transformation that I showed you from possible transformation from layer 4 to layer 2, 3, we know that, there's, that, this, that the connection between them is really, ma really massive. So we know that. Uh, so we know what can fit and what can. And we know in statistical terms what, what can work and what not. Okay, so to summarize what I showed you about the neurons is that, uh, or the internal representations, is they are distributed and they use various codes. There is no single code uh, in the system that uh, represents the external object. And about the way that they are generated, <coughs> I showed you signs of convergence in closed loops. I'll show you the convergence in thalamocortical uh, networks, and I hinted about convergence in motor sensory, uh, a motor sensory convergence, but didn't show you uh, uh, the dynamics of the motor sensory convergence, and I'll use the next five minutes, I think, to show you that. Good. Yeah. So you're saying that there's something uh, sacred about the something like four cycles? I mean, what sacred? Uh, is, is, is it... Uh, so you said the decision is made in something like four cycles. Yes. So this is something that is general, or this you think? Or we have the feeling right now that. Uh, specific for this task. No, we have the feeling that for the rats, 
the four or five cycles is really um, something that is kind of hardwired. So you cannot train the animal to make uh, ten cycles in four days. To force it, to force it to do ten cycles. Just one cycle. Yeah. Uh, it's hard to train them to limit. Uh, we can train them in time, but we cannot tell them how many cycles to do in their time. But uh, it's possible. We, our feeling from now, uh, for, from this data, is that indeed these rats, uh, the four cycles is something like a chunk that they like to use, and, and of course, uh, I think it can be tested. In the next species that I'll show you, it's not it's not exactly four. But you, you can break the, this four by altering the position of the, the bars, let's say, after two or three. Of the of the poles. Yeah. Yes, 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 we can do that. Yes, yes, we can change the word in the middle. Right. Yes, we can do that. <coughs> Not easily because they are very fast. They have to be faster, but we can do it. Okay, so this was the target of Avi to try to quantify the convergence process, and he immediately realized that there is a problem with this species because he does what he wants to do. And usually they have their own experience and their own superstitions, and they have different strategies. We tell that we, I mean, we use our prime conditioning, but we don't know actually what they picked up from the task. We cannot tell that, okay, the rats localize the relative location of the object. They do something in order to get the reward. We don't know exactly what they, they are doing. Uh, so he evolved a new, uh, a new sense. And in the, with the purpose of being able to monitor all the relevant variables. And, and the way he did it was that uh, to make this sense to come with two two sensors. One is a position sensor, and the second is a force sensor. So the position sensor gives us indication of the motor component of the, of the movement, and the force sensor gives us indication for the sensory input. And all of the come attached to this uh, species that you actually can tell him what to do, and he does. <coughs> uh, you, 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 could <laughs> you could ask him how he does it, and he'll tell you how he does it. So, you know, it's, it's very... <laughs> so, and we use the same task. Actually, this was uh, closing the circuit, because this is Jack Knudsen, who, who divides the task for the rest, and now he was forced to do the same task. And the way, the way uh, humans uh, do it, is, uh, surprisingly enough, uh, similar to the rest, they do whisking, they move the hands back and forth, uh, and, uh, and they base the decision, so this is the advantage with the humans, we can tell you how, what they base their decision on, they base their decision on, this is what they tell us, <laughs> and we can actually see also, also objectively that uh, this is what they do, they translate the spatial uh, parameters to temporal parameters, in the following way. So if this is uh, <coughs> an offset of, let's say, 3 centimeters, then the difference between the contact times, the delta T that I showed you before, will represent this offset for them. And as you notice, this is the slope of the head movement is the velocity. Of course, if they change the velocity, they can change the mapping between delta X and delta T. And if they have an arrow, coordination arrow, <coughs> between the two hands, of course, it will, it will change the, the, the coding. So we know that this is the perceptual cue of them, and uh, the perceptual equation, so to speak, is very simple. Delta T is the Q, it equals delta X, the actual offset, minus the discoordination between the hands, divided by the velocity. Since the velocities of two hands were similar for simplicity, for the discussion here, we just put it as a one value. And we, we consider the delta X divided by V as the coding variable, and the delta H divide, divided by V is the error variable in, the <coughs> in this case. So, right. And, uh, and uh, yeah, de definitely the strategies are not the same. And actually now we try to compare, to do comparative analysis and to see what is the difference between the strategies. We have a good knowledge for the human. This is the helpful thing. And then we can infer about the rate. But the rate is very difficult to know. So, <coughs> what basically, in schematic view, what they do is for each hand, they have a kind of a, a lower order loop in which they control the velocity. The velocity, in turn, control the mapping between X and T. And what they use is they use a comparison of some internal representation of T, because they, they don't have delta T out there. They have one T here or one T here. So they have to compare internally uh, the two times and, and get to some uh, uh, decision. 
Uh, indeed, if you look at the uh, psychometric curve, so the real psychometric curve is in blue. This is delta x. This is the actual the thing that they were uh, the task that they were asked to complete. And you can say that you can see that uh, this, uh, these are the answers relative to the relative location of uh, of the two poles. And you can see that this is much shallower than the actual than the psychometric uh, uh, curve computed according to the perceptual view which they were using, which was much sharper. This is delta t. What is the perception skew? Delta t. And the pers the, uh, that, they, they were asked, tell me what, what, which one is more posterior. They were not asked about the time. They used time, and we can see that they used time because psychometric curve for the time was much sharper than this. this, this for the now, how did they use it? So they used whisking, as you see here, uh, nicely coordinated between the hands. And they used many cycles. So they, they didn't use one task. They used several cycles. And the way the dependency of the number of cycles on the difficulty of the task was very nicely ex exponential formed by ex exponential curve, in which, uh, if you now use delta t, which was the real few, uh, the smaller the del delta t, the, the larger the number of cycles that they used in, in the task in an in a exponential way. So instead of one short decision, we say, there is some accumulation, probably logarithmic yeah, accumulation. Right? Sorry? So this is again different from the animals in the sense that they're, they're changing the number of yes, cycles. Yes, right. Uh, no, but you didn't try to make it harder in the animals. If we didn't, in the case of the animals, it was exactly the same thing. It was a, a staircase paradigm. So whenever they did, cor they, did uh, they were correct, we reduced the offset. Whenever they were wrong, we increased. So we used exactly the same uh, thing here. But the rest didn't, didn't care. They always use the four cycles. This is more hardwired in the rest. I tell you one advantage of the rest. I mean, uh, the everything is uh, shows for the more sophisticated use of the human. But humans, it takes them two orders of magnitude longer time to perform the task. So the advantage of the rest are very, very <laughs> simple, but very, <laughs> very. <laughs> everything is more. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so they they sum up they sum up the the measurement and compare it to uh, some confidence level and if it's if it's uh, if it's sufficient they will report it if not they'll do again another whisk another whisk another whisk this is a reasonable model for the behavior now the last question we ask here is if they do it another whisk and another whisk will it do it at the same form just in order to increase the sample size so we have more sample and more sample or Will they present some convergence here in which they use the information that al they already got in order to determine how the next risk will look like? And the answer here is the following. So these are whisking patterns again. And here are the motor variables that we track. There are two kinds of motor variables. One that I showed you already, these are the delta H and V, which are directly related to the acuity of the task. These variables were kept constant along the trial. So these are long trials. Uh, that the, the animals, these animals use. And the uh, velocity and delta H were kept constant along a single trial. But at the same time, uh, they changed the other related motor variables, which were the set point, so when the, when the risking starts, the amplitude became smaller, and the duration became shorter. So there is a convergence process here that helps the, uh, helps the, the subject uh, to localize uh, in a way probably you know, there's no there's no need to scan the area that uh, no is there so it becomes more efficient but keeping the important variables that are used for perception constant and this this reminds an optimal control strategy in which always you have some variables that you want to keep constant and the others is you can pay with these modulations and this pattern suggests that there is another convergence process uh, occurring here. Yes. What notion of uh, integration of elements, like, uh, accumulation of elements? The DT is signed consistent across all primes. The DT what? The sign of the DT is consistent across all primes. Across all primes, or all the cycles all in the trial? Yeah, all the cycles in the trial. Yes, the sign will be, will remain, yes, that DT also remains uh, constant. I mean, in the same way. So the polarity remains the same. And it remains more or less, less constant because delta H and V remains the same. And delta H doesn't change. So delta T. I mean, the problem is integration to bound of this Integration to bound of, of delta T? Yeah. No. 
Uh, well, what what would that mean? Uh, Let's talk about it later. Maybe I can learn something from it. So, uh, okay. So the conclusion is uh, that uh, the inclusion of uh, the object in the loop is done by convergence. This is the process that we uh, that we see across across animals. So let me summarize. What I what I try to argue the statement the general statement that I try to argue is that direct perception means inclusion in a motor sensory loop. This is the only way that direct, that direct perception can live with physics. Inclusion means convergence to steady state. And the best way I found to illustrate it is by uh, the following metaphor. If this is the brain loops and this is the external object, then uh, imagine a spiral running between the, the brain and the loop. And the spiral has two temporal variables. One is the physical time running along the loop. So uh, all the <coughs> uh, physical events are running between the loops, but perceptual time is counted. This is the perceptual clock. So every in, in this game, uh, every interaction with the object will be one perceptual let's say, click of the perceptual time in this uh, metaphor, and perceptual time runs this way. So in this sense, if you take every slot here of the spiral, all the elements are at the same perceptual time. Of course, they are not at the same physical time, but they'll be at the same perceptual time, meaning that the system, the system itself cannot tell, cannot measure its physical time. And this is the time that moves the path there, so it cannot measure. It has to measure some interactions with something, and the something in this case, is the external object. This is the metaphor uh, uh, that works for me, at least. And in this metaphor, we say, at some point, uh, the system converts to a steady state. And only when it converts to a steady state, then that perception can work. So then you will not have any uh, delay and any mediation between the object and the brain. Uh, if you think about a surprising stimulus, something that gradually your attention, of course, you start with not in a steady state, you start with a delay, but as you as you uh, attend to it and uh, perceive it uh, continuously, if you have enough time for the loop, you'll convert to a steady state. So if something interesting, like, like the, the, the train stair ahead of you and you're in, it, in the game, you are supposed to be uh, already in the steady state condition, and in this case, you perceive everything, everything in real time. So the perceptual game of, of, of a given brain uh, uh, in the day, so to speak, is fluctuating between these conditions, moving from indirect perception to direct perception. All the indirect perceptions are of things that surprise us, that they appear, let's say, if we talk about the visual sense, appear at the periphery, not at the fovea. Once they appear there and you decide to move your fovea there, then you start to, to uh, stabilize the loop, and once you are uh, reaching steady state, you are proceeding in real time. If, if it's continuing, to interest you, you remain there. If you you dump the object, you move to another object, and this is the fluctuations between the two kinds of perception. The two other messages is that uh, convergence is done mainly by dynamic motor and not sensory processes. Sensory processes, I didn't show you this, but they don't change basically during this uh, game. Only the motor ones. And another uh, claim that comes out from this entire loop uh, claim is that motor and sensory variables are interchangeable in perception. It's, it's not that the motor ones are kind of modulators or something that just prepare the stage. Like this. They are part of the perceptual total game, and we have evidence for this also. Okay, I showed the pictures and names of the people who made the the, the work and actually bring brought us to assume or to to assume to put forward this assumption, and the, the burden of proof, so to speak, is on the next generation, uh, who builds on the uh, Hebrew language to help them in this sense, because in Hebrew, you know, there is no difference between perception and, and grasping. It's the same thing. And this is basically what, uh, what we try to claim. Thank you.